If you imagine uh, a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, uh, laid out in front of you, then um, as and one moves uh, from the very lowest energies through the radio, through the microwave, millimeter wave, uh, through the terahertz region, and eventually then you get onto the uh, uh, far infrared and of course the optical. Superconducting detector development allows us to understand uh, the uh, formation of stars and the formation of galaxies uh, in considerable detail. And for example, uh, one sees in that part of the spectrum a large number of spectral lines from, from alcohol, and in fact there's more alcohol in space than uh, man has ever brewed. Cosmic microwave background radiation uh, has a black body spectrum, and it was radiation that was left over from uh, the, the Big Bang itself. <laughs> and that radiation has uh, remained largely unchanged in form uh, since the uh, beginning of the universe. Well, one can observe that, and it turns out the best place to observe that is from about 100 gigahertz to 200 gigahertz. So what we need to do is to um, find some way of developing uh, technology for uh, this frequency range between 100 gigahertz and 1 terahertz. So 100 gigahertz corresponds to a wavelength of uh, 3 millimetres and 1 terahertz to uh, a wavelength of uh, 300 microns. And this part of the spectrum uh, is uh, exceedingly difficult to work in because it is intermediate between uh, the radio uh, and the optical. So what I mean by that is if you were to ask a radio engineer um, what, what they mean by power detection, they will give you a description in terms of nonlinear diodes and currents and uh, radio type, type ideas. If you were to ask an optical physicist what they mean by detection, they tell you about the photoelectric effect and the absorption of photons uh, by materials. But in the terahertz frequency range, those two descriptions must merge into each other. So as you move from the radio through into the far infrared, as you move through the terahertz frequency range, then the, uh, you have to, in order to describe how a detector works, you have to think of it both in terms of its radio description, but also in terms of its optical description. You might ask, well, why can't you use any material for working at these sorts of wavelengths? And in fact, if other materials were capable of working at these sorts of wavelengths, I would be using those. Semiconductors where the energy gap, which is the minimum excitation energy, is of the order of the one electron volt. In the case of superconductors, we know that the energy gap is 1,000 less than uh, this value, is of the order of one milli electron volt. And so, uh, for the same amount of energy which is incoming on the detector, you obtain 1,000 more excitation than, uh, than with the traditional detectors. And it turns out, for example, that the uh, small value of the energy gap in the superconducting case is what gives the superconducting detector such excellent uh, uh, energy resolution compared to any other type of, uh, of detector. Why we work on superconducting detectors here in Cambridge is so that we can get access to this frequency range. It's not the other way around. It's not that we necessarily want to do superconductors and therefore uh, work in whatever frequency range uh, uh, that they tend to operate at. It's the other way around. It's that we want to be able to do physics, we want to be do able to do astronomical observations. Uh, in the terahertz part of the spectrum, and it's the superconductivity uh, that allows us to do that. So why is it that superconductors are so special at this frequency range? And it's simply that the energy gap, in other words, the amount of energy that you have to supply in order to break superconducting pairs, lies precisely in the terahertz frequency range. If we take a, a superconductor uh, at, at absolute zero, and let's allow a single uh, high energy X-ray photon uh, to interact. This will interact by an atomic process. Uh, it will basically eject a very high energy electron from an atom in the superconductor. The fact that it's superconducting doesn't matter at all at this process. And we produce a very, very high energy electron, basically a single high energy electron. This will start to scatter with other electrons um, and actually uh, produce more higher energy electrons as it reduces its own uh, energy. Electrons with much higher energies and in particular with energies which are above the superconducting gap. Of course these electrons just can move into the superconductor and they 
can be transformed into a quasi-particle in the superconductor and they can do so, and they will. And at that point, we have a high energy quasi-particle in the superconductor and within the corresponding scattering length, this quasi-particle will lose its energy and it will relax down, find a friend and condense into the compensate. The electrons further decay, emitting more uh, high energy phonons, and the phonons them themselves will start to anharmonically decay, producing lower energy phonons. These uh, phonons, for example, start to interact with the Cooper pairs, producing higher energy quasiparticles. So I hope superconducting detectors uh, rely on detecting excitations from the ground state. We can represent the ground state uh, as the uh, C of uh, Cooper pairs. Zero energy, at all at the chemical potential. And then the excitation spectrum of the quasiparticles from this ground state. Quasiparticle energy, wave vector. Uh, and the excitation spectrum is symmetrical, again, about the, uh, the Fermi wave vector. Excitation spectrum shows uh, an energy gap between the Cooper pairs and the first allowed states for the quasiparticle excitations. What this means is uh, that to create a single quasiparticle ex ex excitation, we must put in at least uh, delta, the energy gap. So for niobium, for example, that has an energy gap of um, about three um, milli electron volts, which corresponds to um, a frequency of about 700 gigahertz. There is a material niobium titanium nitride, which has a slightly energy gap at about one terahertz. And there are materials like tantalum, uh, which have uh, energy gaps of about 300 gigahertz. But nevertheless, as you can see, that all the classical low TC superconducting materials have energy gra gaps in the terahertz frequency range. And that's why they're so uh, special to our own work. Okay, now, now, now we must think about um, uh, how we actually create excitations in the superconducting case. And the, the first thing to think about is uh, phonons, the lattice vibrations in the system. So, phonon. If the phonon has sufficient energy, uh, it can break the Cooper pairs and create excitations. Now, it, it's important now to realise that the Cooper pair is two. Uh, paired electrons, so that actually breaking up the Cooper pair means creating two quasiparticle excitations. Phonons capable of breaking Cooper pairs must have energies which are uh, greater than or equal to twice the energy gap. Now of course the reverse process can also happen, where if we've got a superconductor with two excitations, uh, these can recombine. When the quasiparticles recombine, they emit a two delta phonon. Two delta phonon can't all that easily get out of the thin film, it remains trapped, and it breaks another pair. Or, depending on the geometry of the superconducting film, can be lost into the substrate. And the whole process can go basically on and on and on. And the net effect of this, at sufficiently low temperatures, is to decouple the quasiparticle excitations and the above gap phonons, phonons with energy, energy greater than 2 delta, from the other phonon excitations in the system. So superconductor is a, a system in which they coexist uh, three fluid systems, which are Cooper pairs, which are the uh, usual carrier of uh, inform electrical information in the, in the materials, but we have also quasiparticles, which are the excitations and phonons. These three systems are both can be uh, used in the case of detectors, not only a uh, Cooper pair. So what we need in, in, uh, in practice is to destroy Cooper pair by the incoming radiation and produce excitation, which will be, of course, quasiparticles or phonons. And we have to measure these quantities. It's quite a range of uh, different devices 
uh, that can be used. And uh, it depends on the precise nature of the astrophysics that you're wanting to do as to which uh, device type is chosen. Superconducting devices, so exciting and so, really so interesting because they are so flexible. Um, the basic detector has to consist of uh, an absorber and a sensor and then some way of reading out the signal from the sensor. Of, of getting energy into the superconductor depends on what we're trying to measure, what quantum we're trying to measure. Is it an X-ray photon, optical photon? Is it a massive molecule? Is it uh, an RF field? Uh, the details of how energy from these uh, sources interacts with the superconductor and then uh, produces measurable quasi-particle excitations varies to some extent depending on the, the the amount of energy and the type of energy which is going in. So for X-ray systems, say, where X-rays have uh, long uh, penetration depths into materials, you need a, a large volume of material to actually capture the signal. Now that wouldn't be the case if you're trying to detect, say, optical photons, which interact, uh, interact in the first tens of nanometers of the uh, superconductor surface. Nor, say, if you're trying to detect uh, heavy molecules which simply smash into the surface of the superconductor and create the excitations. And it's those excitations which you can uh, then measure. So the devices essentially fall into uh, two different categories. Either one is merely wanting to measure all of the power radiated by some astronomical source. In other words, you're not worried about what its spectrum looks like, you're merely interested in how bright it is. And uh, devices of that kind uh, are usually called uh, bolometers and observations of that kind are called photometric observations. Transitionate sensors and kinetic inductance detectors are the devices that one uh, wants to use if you're doing uh, photometric observations of a source. If you want to actually uh, make a spectral, spectral line observations, in other words you're interested in uh, the detail, detail spectral information which is within the source, or if you're wanting to build an astronomical interferometer, so if you remember, an astronomical interferometer consists of a number of telescopes which are separated by either tens of metres or in some cases hundreds of metres and kilometres. Then what you have to do is to be able to bring the signals from different telescopes and combine them in order to build up a full interferometer. So if you're wanting to either do spectroscopy or interferometry, then you need to use uh, a different kind of device. And here we use uh, the uh, SIS mixer or superconducting insulator, superconducting tunnel junction mixer.